hearts. We will say yes, God, yes to you. Lord, we choose to praise you this day. Lord, we choose to honor you and lift up the name of Jesus in this place. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our heart today, Lord, as your word is shared. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lord, may we be sensitive to what you're saying to each of us individually. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all together. In his name we say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Anybody besides me eat too much over the holidays? That tends to be what we do, right? We get to this time of year and we just eat after gathering, after gathering. And as we do that, there's nothing wrong with that. I noticed my sister-in-law posted something on Facebook and she says, Yeah, I've been working out good to start the year and I'm almost back to my pre-holiday weight. And, and, and so there's things in this world that God allows us to enjoy. There, there's things in this world that we have the opportunity to take part in. Uh, God created it, it's his world. But we want to make sure that we don't live our life like we eat during the holidays every day. We want to make sure that the things of this world are not the things that we pursue most. The things of this world are blessings from God, but we need to make sure even the good things that we don't overindulge and take too much time and start to put our priority in the things of this world rather than our priority in God. Now, our natural tendency of who we are is, as the flesh is to take on the things of this world. And so we want to make sure that God delivers us from that. Now, the first deliverance is our deliverance for salvation. But also, even as believers, we want to be delivered each day from the temptation. That's how Jesus taught us to pray, to deliver us from the temptation of the Lord. Each day, or the temptations of this world, we want to be delivered by the Lord each day. And, and so I just want to make sure that as we start this year, that we begin to reflect on this fact that, that we need to make sure that God delivers us and will deliver us every day. He delivers us. Because he loves us. Scripture tells us that God provides us a way to resist temptation. It's because he loves us. God created man in his image to have uh, fellowship with him. And so that we have the opportunity to worship him. And to return the love that he has given us. Now what we are going to do over the next, or through the month of January, is we're just going to do a series on ordinary people that do extraordinary things. And we're just going to look at four people in Scripture that um, God uses. Now, here's the, 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 the real secret is this. Even the great people in the Bible, Abraham, Moses, David, they were ordinary people that God called out to use. David was the youngest of the brothers. Abraham was following the Canaanite religion. Moses had a flea for 40 years and was in the wilderness. Paul killed people that were involved in the church and yet became the great church planner. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so that's going to be our focus as we look this month. We're going to look at a passage in Judges, chapter 3. I'm confident that this is not a passage that you hear preached on every year. I've already had a couple of people that know the story walk up to me and go, I'm just really anxious to see where you go with this. Because it's a little bit different than a lot of passages. Uh, Brian and I were joking this week, if uh, you wanted to do a movie on the book of Judges that's true to the stories in Judges, it would have to be an R-rated movie. Um, because of the violence and everything that goes on there. So um, it's really an incredible book. It concludes with the statement or near the end of the book. It says everybody does or did what was right in their own eyes. They pursued the things of this world. They chose to go after the things of themselves. There's a cycle that's repeated throughout the book of Judges. Basically, the people are walking with God. That's how the book starts. They've gone into the promised land. Joshua's their leader. And then after Joshua died, they went away from God and they sinned. And after they would sin, because God loves us, he would send discipline into their life. They would be taken over. After a period of time, they would cry out to God. 
because of the oppression that they had. God would send a judge to deliver them. While that judge was alive, they would have peace. But after a while, they would wander away again. And so my hope is for all of us uh, that as we look at this story today and as we think about again our life in this coming year, uh, that we can avoid those circles uh, where we wander away from God and he has to discipline us to bring us back into right relationship with him. So with that being said, turn to Judges chapter 3. Uh, we are going to read about Ehud, who is the second of the judges in this book. God's word says in Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He sent Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel because they had done what was evil in the Lord's sight. After Eglon convinced the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join forces with him, he attacked and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites served Eglon of Moab 18 years. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord. And he raised up Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed Benjamite, Benjamite, as a deliverer for them. The Israelites sent him to Eglon, king of Moab, with tribute money. Ehud made himself a double-edged sword, 18 inches long. He strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes and brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was an extremely fat man. When Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he dismissed the people who had carried it. At the craved images near Gilgal, he returned and said, King Eglon, I have a secret message for you. The king called for silence, and all of his attendants left him. And then Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in his room upstairs where it was cool. Ehud said, I have a word from God for you. And the king stood up from his throne. Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into Eglon's belly. Even the handle went in after the blade, and Eglon's fat closed in over it, so that Ehud did not withdraw the sword from his belly. And Eglon's insides came out. Ehud escaped the way of the porch, closing and locking the doors of the upstairs room behind him. Ehud was gone with Eglon's servants, came in. They looked and found the doors of the upstairs room locked and thought he was relieving himself in the cool room. Servants waited until they became worried and saw that he had not opened the door upstairs, so they took the key and opened the door, and there was their Lord lying dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while the servants waited. He crossed over the Jordan near the carved images near Syrah, and he arrived. He sounded the horn, ram's horn throughout the country, hillside of the country of Ephraim. The Israelites came down with him from the hill country, and he became their leader. He told them, follow me, because the Lord has handed over your enemies, the Moabites, to you. So they followed him, captured the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all strong and able-bodied men. No one escaped. Moab became subject to Israel that day, and the land was peaceful 80 years. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Dear God, we come before you today again to praise you as the Almighty God. We thank you for your word. Oh, thank you for this story, one that we don't go over a whole lot, not one we teach our kids in Sunday school, but Lord, it's your truth. And you have given us this passage to help us to understand who you are and to help us to understand our relationship with you. And so, Lord, this morning we pray that through the truth of your divine word and through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will convict us, draw us into a deeper relationship with you, that we may indeed depart from this place knowing that we have heard from the Almighty God because of your love for us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. The theme of our passage is that God provides deliverance when we follow his call on our life. God provides deliverance when we follow his call on our life. It was really interesting reading 
a lot of different commentaries on this passage. There were people that completely um, did it as symbolism, um, that, that took every single thing that was there to mean something. The sword meant the word of God. Uh, that is the link sword that's uh, referred to uh, in uh, Ephesians. Or, or in the, uh, the spirit of the Lord, the armor of God. But I think we have to be careful whenever we spiritualize texts uh, because they're designed to be for the original reader and the original readers would not have had Ephesians and so we need to make sure that we don't over-spiritualize the text. Uh, there's a lot of interesting ways to understand this passage and the, so the main thing we're going to do as we walk through it, we want to look at the, what the primary thing that we learn is, which is the cycle from the book of Judges, that God delivers us. Even though we're sinful, God delivers us. But that deliverance comes when we follow his call in our life, when we obey him. There are a couple quotes that I want to read. Um, a guy named da David I um, Isaac Block uh, that wrote for the New American Commentary. And there's a couple things he said that I want us to just think about as we, before we dig straight into the text. He says, while the sequence of episodes is clear, it's a pretty straightforward story, <clears throat> the narrator is obviously not interested merely in chronicling historical events. Now, understand, that's always true. <clears throat> the history that we have in the Bible is true history, but it is never written just for us to have history. It's written for us to know more about God and our relationship with Him, but particularly in this story, uh, that holds true. Uh, with effective employment of ambiguity, irony, satire, hyperbole, and caricature, he sketches a literary cartoon that pokes fun at the Moabites, and brings glory to God. In fact, the account is so polemical and coarse that many scholars deny any historical basis. What he's saying is, the, it's a comedy of errors. And there's so many comedy of errors in this story that a lot of people say, no, this story can't be completely true because nobody's that dumb. And so we'll see that as we go through. Eglon, it says, no Israelite would have missed the caricaturing play on his name. Eglon is the meaning of form of the word bull or calf, and so part, it comes from a word that means bull. And then it also recalls the term round or rotund. So it's about a fat bull. This fat bull we see in this story gets led to slaughter. And that's really part of the story, an underlying picture that the author wants us to hold going through this story. Finally, taken as a whole, this literary cartoon of Eglon and his countrymen is not only aimed at the Moabites, but is ironical as well. The man whom God had strengthened because God had allowed Moab, king, to lead over the Israelites, he will eventually be reduced to a heap of fat and excrement. The author's deliberate satire of Eglon in particular and the Moabites and the Moabites in general should not blind the reader to the ridicule he is casting upon his own people. As we mock the Moabites and their king, the story was written for the Israelites and their failures, and we want to keep that in mind. After all, the book of Judges was not primarily written to mock foreigners. It challenges the Israelites to reflect on their own condition. Far from being the noble people they claim to be in the Canaanized state, they have been reduced to less than the Moabites. See, that's where our story starts. Is the Israelites, God's chosen people, that have had victory in the promised land, have been reduced to less than the Moabites. Enemies consistently of the Israelites. Born out of the unholy relationship between Lot and his daughter that conceived after he got drunk, after they fled Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where the Moabites come from and the Ammonites that are in this story. And so this rebellious group of people that don't know God and don't worship God have supremacy over God's chosen people when our story starts. Why do they have that superiority? Why are they placed over the Israelites? Because of the sin of the Israelites. The Israelites did again what was evil in the Lord's sight. 
God didn't give the Moabites victory because God liked the Moabites. God gave the Moabites victory because he wanted to discipline the Israelites. See, that's what we see in this first part of the story is just the oppression. The oppression at the start of the story. He, being God, gave Eglon, king of power, over Israel. See, Eglon thinks it's him. Big, fat king would dwarf me, and he thinks he's a great king and has gotten all these victories by himself. The author wants us to know that God used him, not because of his greatness, but because he was going to discipline the, uh, the Israelites. How many times is it that we let something in this world have power over us? This world can have power over us only when we as believers allow it or send our way into it. Because he that is in me is greater that is in the world. And yet the Israelites are being oppressed. They're oppressed for 18 years. He gave him power because the evil the Israelites had done in the Lord's sight. And then he got the Ammonites and the Malachites to join forces. And he took the city of Palms. Kind of interesting. That's the, the um, nickname. Los Angeles is what? The city of angels, right? It may be a nickname for the city. It's always kind of interesting. If you watch NBA basketball, which I know not many of you do, but they've got a lot of ridiculous jerseys now of nicknames for their cities, and a lot of them are even nicknames of the city the people in the city have never heard of because not every city has a nickname, but some do. Well, the city of Palms is Jericho. That's its name. It's likely a summer home for this king. Think about that. Where was the first great victory for Joshua? It was in the city of Jericho. The walls came tumbling down. And when they say walls, by the way, there's an interesting thing. If you have right now media, I'd encourage you sometime to look up the walls of Jericho and what it says about that. Because basically it was a wall, and then there was some, some stuff built in there, and then there was another wall, so it would be really hard for people to be able to penetrate the other fascinating thing is archaeologically, they've dug up the city of Jericho and the walls. If I'm going to attack a city, we would anticipate that the walls would be inward. The walls are outward, opened up by God. Isn't that fascinating? That city that they weren't supposed to inherit and they lived in anyway is now controlled by the Moabites. It's where the king has his summer residence, the city of palms this beautiful romantic name of a city and yet the world has oppression over god's children because of the sin in their life again every bad thing that happens in my life is not necessarily a result of sin but make no mistake that if i am equally wrong if i think that none of the bad stuff that happens in my life is not God's discipline on me. God says, and our record in Hebrews 13, God disciplines those he loves. So the only thing scarier than facing the discipline of God is God not disciplining me because I'm not his child. So I need to be able to have the discernment in my prayer and in my quiet time to understand that if what's going on in my life is God oppressing me to call me back to him, or if it's for some other reason. But make no mistake, God will punish us and oppress us when we sin. We won't lose our salvation. The children of Israel were still the children of Israel. But they had to force and serve the king of Moab for 18 years. And so we see the oppression. Verse 15, we talked about this in the cycle. We see the repentance. The repentance. Look in verse 15. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. They understood that they had been sinful. They understood that this punishment had come from God. And so they cried out to the Lord. And he, being the Lord, raised up Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed Benjamite. Now, a couple of things there. Notice that it wasn't because Ehud was necessarily this great guy. It's God raised him up. Our power to do ministry doesn't come within ourselves it comes because God raises us up to the ministry that he calls us to. I think I've shared you all with this before. 
I was 31 years old, and they asked me to teach a men's Sunday school class. And I said, no, because I don't feel comfortable speaking in front of adults. That didn't work out so good for me. Or maybe it worked out really well, but it certainly worked out differently than I anticipated. God raises us up. It's, he uses our talent. See, that's the interesting thing. And we lose this in the English. Benjamin actually means son of the right hand. So he is a left-handed son of the right-hand tribe. The right hand is the power sign. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Now, here's the interesting part uh, uh, about Ehud. And we don't know this, and different commentaries are different about how they say it. You really don't even use the word left hand. It's how we translate it to make it easier to understand in English. But basically, he is um, from the tribe of Benjamin with a mauled or hindered right hand. Uh, because his right hand didn't work. Or, it could be that sometimes the idea of being left-handed meant that you were appendextrous. And as Patrick Rayner always reminds me, if you're from NC State, that means you're amphibious. But he could use his right hand or his left hand. And so there's a part in the Bible, there's a couple places where there are people from the tribe of Benjamin that can shoot the arrow equally well with their right hand or left hand. So, so is it that Ehud's special because he can use his left hand and his right hand? Or is he hindered because he has a, a, a maimed or a hindered or a weak right hand? And my answer is I don't know. But here's what I do know. That God can use my strength if I'm appendextrous. God can use my weakness if I only have one hand. Doesn't matter. God created me for a specific mission, for a specific purpose, with the skills and the lack of skills that he gives me. So it doesn't matter which way it goes. The key to this sentence is that they cried out to God, and God sent a deliverer. When I cry out to God, when I genuinely repent, repent means going one way, now I'm going to go the other. It's like doing a U-turn. That's what the word repentance means. When I legitimately repent, God sends a deliverer. When I'm sincere and saying, that I want to change my life for God, that he hears me and he delivers me. I was laughing this week. Uh, I, I love watching Colin Cowherd. I record it, watch parts of it every day. He, he, his, he does one New Year's resolution a year, and it's always he's going to quit something. And on the January 2nd episode of The Herd, he said, well, so far I'm doing pretty good on my New Year's resolution. I've only slipped up once or twice on January 2nd. Here's the question when I respond to God. Is it a New Year's resolution, resolution that I'm going to forget pretty soon? Or is it a genuine change of heart because I've repented? It doesn't mean I won't fail, but it does mean I should fail a lot less. So we have the repentance. Then we get to the deliverance. Ehud makes himself an 18-inch sword. Again, if you want to spiritualize the text, you can say it's the word of God. I, I, I tend to not do that because I think we need to read the story for the way it's written for the original readers. And so we don't want to over-spiritualize things, learn lessons in general. But it is true that God's word does help to deliver us. Straps it to his right thigh under his clothes. Brings the tribute to the king. All right, so he takes the tribute. They, they, had, to pay, uh, you know, they had to pay money to the king because he oppressed them. The penalty, tax for somebody being over you. And so they got Ehud to be the one that presents it so the king knows who he is. It gives us this idea of Eglon being extremely fat. And so again, we've got the fatted calf that's extremely fat. And so you, it, uh, uh, there's a show they used to watch called Psych. They had a character named Dale the Whale that was so wide he couldn't get out of his bed. He was like, I mean, just because he was so fat. That's kind of what I picture with this guy. Just somebody so fat he can't even get out of bed. It, it's mocking. The idea that the Moabites completely indulged in the things of this world. This king is fat and happy thinking he has what he has because of himself. 
but it's only because God's allowed him to have it. He is the fatted calf about to be slaughtered because his trust is in himself and not in God. So it gives us the description that Ehud goes and sees him and then he goes to him this next time, approached him while he was sitting alone in his room upstairs where it was cool, so he's upstairs in a room. It's for the, the, the breeze, whatever, it makes that room a little bit cooler. And Ehud says, I have a word from God for you. Well, first he tells him he has a secret message. King called for silence, and all of his attendants left him. So I've got a special word for you. So the king is going to be left alone with the man that brings the tribute from the people that oppress him. There's absolutely no chance that somebody you're oppressing would ever want to try to kill you. What kind of bodyguards are these? Yes, we're just going to leave you alone. That's part of the satire that it's talking about that's in here. When you talk about the foolishness, our sin blinds us. Our trust in ourself blinds us. And so here's this king. Oh, he brought me the tribute. He certainly wouldn't hurt me. Y'all go ahead and leave the room. How foolish is that? How foolish are the people that left him to allow that to happen? So then he says, I have a word from God for you. And the king stood up from his throne. It would be often that uh, you would stand to hear a word from any god. And so he's going to stand up to hear this word from God. And by the way, does anybody think that as he stands up, that there's any doubt in Ehud's mind that this is about to be a good word from God. I'm the king. You've already paid me my tribute. Oh, good. Now tell me something good. So he stands up to receive the good news. Again, we're blinded to reality when we're blinded by sin. Remember David, by the way, after he committed his sin with Bathsheba? And Nathan the prophet goes and confronts him. And he gives him a parable about a man that had everything, and then he took just a little bit the man next to him had, and David goes, that man deserves death. And Nathan looks at him and goes, hey, David, that's you. David was blinded by his sin. Eglon, blinded by his sin. So he's going to stand up. The king stood up from his throne. Ehud reached with his left hand, took his sword from his right thigh, plunged it into his belly. Even the handle goes in, the fat closed over it, and he did not withdraw the sword from his belly. And Eglon's insides came out. That's just pretty gross, isn't it? I, I, I loved one of the commentaries that I read talking about the reason. He, you hear some interesting things. Be careful what you read. Just don't over-spiritualize stuff. I don't think we're supposed to have any meaning that the sword was left in him as the word of God other than he was just fat and the sword got left in there. He was murdered. The idea that his insides came out, it could be that it was intestines, but it's not likely that because an 18-inch sword, even though it stays in there, is not going to have that much room for stuff to flow out. By the way, this is the kind of sermon I'm glad we have children's church, and I'd be a little more open about what we're talking about. But basically what it is that he would have, uh, his body would have just relieved itself. And so it would have just been excrement and mess on the floor near his body where he bled to death. The king that thought he was everything, as we read in that quote, was left as a pile of fat and increment and blood. God deliver the people. I want to skip down now for the victory, beginning in verse 26. By the way, he escapes. This is part of the farcical nature of the guards again is it says that Ehud escapes out the window, then it goes into more detail. It says he locked the door, and as he locks the door uh, so the people can't get in, it basically so we can escape, the, the guards knock on the door. So I've got our king in here with a guy we don't know that's a foreigner that we oppress. We knock on the door, and our immediate response is nothing's wrong, so he's probably just using the bathroom, so we'll leave him alone. Then they finally get worried enough that they go into the room and find out and find the king laying there as a pile. How crazy is that for people that are supposed to protect the king? Blindness when we don't follow God. So now we see the victory, verse 26. Ehud escaped while the servants waited. So they were waiting outside. He crossed over the Jordan near the carved images, reached Sarah. After he arrived, he sounded the ram's horn throughout the country of Ephraim. The Israelites came down with him from the hill country. 
He became their leader. Notice he wasn't the leader when he went there. They had just picked him to take the offering. Now he's going to be their leader. Notice what he says. Link together what we saw early, God called him. Now notice what it says. Follow me, because the Lord, Yahweh, has handed over your enemies, the Moabites, to you. He didn't say, I've killed the king. He didn't say the Moabites are weakened. The old sports expression is chop off the head, the body dies in basketball. You know, if you get rid of the best player, then the rest of the team's going to fall apart. He didn't say that. What he says is, one man's dead tells us that God has given us the victory. So let's go. God gave the victory, not Ehud. Again, other than Jesus Christ, that's always the answer in the Bible. It's no man, it's God. In fact, I think it's in James, it talks about Elijah just an ordinary man like me and you. And he prayed and it didn't rain for three years because he prayed it. Just an ordinary man. Now, we don't think of Elijah as ordinary, but that's how he's described in Scripture, so that's probably more accurate than what we think. God uses ordinary people. He raised up Ehud. Ehud realizes that he was raised up for God's glory, not his own. He doesn't say, ooh, look at me, I'm the leader now, I killed the king. He says, no, God's given us the victory, let's go. That's the message for us as a church. Jesus gave us the victory on Calvary. Let's go. We know we've won the war. Now we just have to win the battles. They followed him, captured the fords of the Jordan, leading to Moab. Did not allow anyone to cross over. At that time, they struck down 10,000 Moabites. All the strong and able bodied men, not one escaped. Not one escaped. Because God gave the victory. God gave the deliverance. They were oppressed for 18 years. They had peace for what? 80. God's victory is greater than whatever ensnares us in this world. Whatever temptation, whatever trial, whatever failure we have. When we turn to God, his grace is greater and will give us greater peace than the oppression that we fall under because of our sin. A few things to consider for this story that I want us to just take note of, try to highlight them as we went through, but first of all is the folly of this world. The folly of this world. I, I love Psalm 2 and how it starts out, and this just fits in with Eglon. Why do the people, the nations rebel and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. The plans of the world are foolish. The plans of Eglon were foolish because they don't endure if they're not from God. The folly of pursuing this world. John writes it this way in 1 John chapter. 2, beginning in verse 15, do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who does God's will remains forever. It's foolish to trust this world because it all passes away. The only thing that's eternal are the things of God. It was foolish for Eglon and his soldiers to trust in their own abilities and to think they had everything under control because they only had their power because God had given it to him. Whenever I pursue something in this world, Lee loves pickleball. Lee used to love golf. I used to play golf with him a lot. Now he plays pickleball every day. No, it's not really every day. But the question is, because I had this battle with golf for a while in my life, do I make golf more important than God? Do I make pickleball more important 
than God, or do I use it as an opportunity to enjoy what God's put in this world to do his ministry? See, it's not necessarily that everything's bad. But what do I do with it? My family. God wants us to have a good family, to be a strong family. But it's possible to put my family even before God and to do things for my family instead of being part of the ministry that God's given me and doing what God would have me to do in my life. The question is, am I willing to give everything to God? That's what we talk about when we say saving faith. When we talk about saving faith, the belief that saves me from my sin, believing that Christ died and rose again, believing that Jesus rose from the dead and that he ascended to heaven, one day he's coming back again. I have to believe he's God. I have to believe that. I have to believe that Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin on the cross. And that no longer have a death penalty to pay because Jesus paid it for me. But if I have genuine faith, what's that going to look like? And there's two things that are going to happen. One is I'm going to confess my sins. Now, my confession doesn't save me, but my faith that leads me to confession. The faith is what saves me, and then God forgives me. But I'm also going to, Jesus is going to be the Lord of my life. It doesn't mean I'm never going to sin. But it means that I'm going to take that life that God gives me. Paul says this tent that I live in the life I live in this body, I'm going to live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of my life? Or am I trusting in the things of this world to give me happiness and pleasure and peace and comfort? Because that genuinely only comes when we receive Christ and the Holy Spirit enters me. So, so the first thing we have to remember, what we want to consider in this story, is that the folly of this world compared to the greatness of God's gospel. Which leads to our second point. The importance and ability to following Jesus. It's important, but we also have the ability to do it. Notice what John records. In John chapter 14, this is Jesus last night with his disciples. And he says this, beginning in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commands. That's very similar to what we just read in John's letter, right? But notice this. So if you love God, you're going to keep my commands, but I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. Now the world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. The world's never going to have the spirit of God in them until they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We should never expect the world to act like Christians because they don't know Jesus. The world's unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. He remains in you. He's going to be in you. In Ephesians 1, it says at the time of salvation, the Holy Spirit is sealed in us to mark us for the return of Christ. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. Not only are we expected to follow God's commands, God gives us the ability to do it. Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God that works in you both to will and to act according to his good purposes. God works into me to will and to act according to his good purposes. It's important to follow God. Now here's the careful thing that we have to be we want to be careful of, mindful of this morning, is we don't want to just say, okay, if I sin, that means God's going to punish me and everything's, my life's just falling apart. If I continue to sin, that's going to happen. God gives us the ability to follow. But God also says, John also writes this, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not participating in truth. That sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? John says if we want to have fellowship with him and yet we're sinning, we're not practicing truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But notice what it says in verse 8. 
If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So it's a weird dichotomy that we have to live with that God says there's not a, a sin, that he's not going to give me an ability to escape, but I know I'm going to sin. But if I do sin, then it means I'm not walking with God, so how do I reconcile that? I want to live as close as I can to a life with no known sin. Now, I say no known sin because even if I don't know I sin today, I can promise you we have sinned. That's why in the Old Testament we have the sin offering to offer for the sins that we don't know that we commit. So no matter how holy I get, there's still something in my life God can reveal to me that I'm doing wrong. So that's why God says, strive. Live under the power of God. God always provides us a way of escape. But know that if we fall, to God's worst, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. So we know we're going to sin, but we need to make sure that we are striving to grow in Christ and living more under his word all the time. Finally, the last thing we want to remember from this story is the faithfulness of God. It didn't rely on the Israelites. They confessed and God responded, but the power of God was always there. God could have continued to punish them because, oh, they deserved it. The wages of sin is death. But God is faithful to his promises. Hebrews 13. The author writes this. Kind of a series of commands. So not, the context is just kind of a, nothing around it that it has a big impact on understanding. It just says this. Your life should be free from the love of money. Money often represents the things of this world. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I should be satisfied with the situation I'm in in life because no matter what's going on in my life right now, God is with me. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God is with us. God is with me right now with no matter what difficulty, challenge, celebration that I may have, God is with me. He is faithful. Finally, I want to look at one quick passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't normally start in the middle of a verse, but it just reads better doing it that way. So therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so I would not exalt myself. I, we have no idea. This is Paul writing. We don't know what this is. But something had continued to oppress Paul. So there may be a thorn in the flesh that's never going away from my life because God's going to use it. And that's what it says here. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. God's power is completed, not in our strengths, but our weakness. Doing things that we don't necessarily think we can do, and then we have to rely on the power of God. My ministry should stretch me beyond where I'm comfortable so that I'm relying on the power of God. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about the weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and impressures. Because of Christ. For when I am weak, he is strong. I'm strong because of the power that God gives me. What can I learn from this story? God delivers when I'm obedient and don't pursue the things of this world. It may be something evil that's oppressing me right now, but God can deliver me and give me victory because God is faithful. You bow your heads with me. I want us to take just a moment to just let God speak. What is it that God's saying to my head? What can I learn of the different things that we've seen in the story? Where is it that God speaking to me am I egg and the Moabites I need a savior 
Am I the Israelites and I need to repent? Am I Ehud and I need to allow God to raise me up to do the ministry he's calling me to and allow him to do that in my life? God moving me this morning that I need to confess something in my life that I've let have power over me for far too long. This is the morning I need to cry out to God. And even if it's the thorn in the flesh that God's not going to deliver me from to give me the confidence to live with that weakness and that struggle with strength, giving God the glory, knowing that he's using that to complete me. Maybe that's the power I need this morning. Maybe that's how God speaks to my heart. What action do I need to take? One of my former preaching professors used to say, when you give an application, make it something people can write down. What do I need to do this week? I can't give that to you in your life. But God can. What's the one note God would love for you to write down and say, this is what I'm going to do this week differently? Because I love you. We're going to sing a hymn. The altar is open. I'll be here to front if you want to speak to me. God, we praise you as God. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you move in our hearts. Give us the wherewithal to live out the will that you prompted within us. To do what you called us to do. To be what you called us to be. In the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn.